Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation and lindsayweitzel.com. I have a history of chronic and daily migraines that began at the age of four. I am super excited to tell you that our guest today is Dr. Betsy Grunch. Hello, Dr. Grunch. How are you today? I'm good. I hope you are. I am too. Many of you may know Dr. Grinch from social media as Lady Spine Doc. Dr. Grinch is a neurosurgeon specializing in minimally invasive spine surgery. She works out of the Longstreet Clinic for Neurosurgery in Georgia. And today we are going to ask her some questions about cervicogenic headache and the role of a neurosurgeon in this diagnosis. So first of all, I'm really curious to clear up what cervicogenic headache is, because I know we have many people watching today and listening today who probably have neck pain uh, with their various headache diagnoses, if they have NDPH, if they have migraine, whatever they have, many of us get head or excuse me, neck pain along with it. So let's talk about how the diagnosis of cervicogenic headache is different from other types of head pain. Yeah. So a cervicogenic headache is, it's kind of like a secondary headache. So meaning that it's like caused by something else. So with a cervicogenic headache, it originates from a problem in the neck, uh, mm -hmm. like the name would suggest. So it's not like a pri primary migraine disorder, but it's ca a headache caused from a, a neck issue. Um, and it's often like referred from either the musculoskeletal structures in the spine, which I deal with all the time nerve structures in the spine and how those can radiate and cause pain in the head and face. So it's a little different than your, you know, migraine type um, headache. Okay. Do you have to have sustained some type of neck injury to have a cervicogenic headache or can you just sort of be born with it? Um, I mean, the answer to your question is no, you don't have to have trauma necessarily to mm -hmm. have a cervicogenic headache, but it can be related to any type of neck issues, not related to trauma. So of course, trauma can definitely cause strain, musculoskeletal strain, ligament strain that can cause headache, but it often can arise from arthritis that we all kind of get as we get older or from um, some type of degenerative issue in our neck. Um, and even younger people with like connective tissue disorders that have maybe a little bit of hypermobility or um, problems like that can get irritation of those structures that can uh, cause headaches from that. Okay, you brought up connective tissue disorders and some of the soft tissue structures. Is it always something that can be seen on a scan? Yeah, absolutely not. And I think that's where um, some issues come in with misdiagnosis. And it's not always something that we see with, uh, with imaging. So of course, people with Suspected neck issues, we'll get x-rays, we can get MRIs or CTs, um, but sometimes those are normal and pa patients still experience cervicogenic headaches because of, you know, mus muscle issue or muscle strain or, or tenseness or abnormal posture, or like we uh, just hit on the musculoskeletal or connective tissue disorders like hypermobility can cause strain to those, quote, normal looking joints on imaging. Okay. So how is it diagnosed and what type of physician usually makes this diagnosis? So it can be diagnosed by any physician, um, you know, primary care, neurology, neurosurgeons, spine specialists, but there's not like a definitive test for it. So the diagnosis is more based on history. You know, if you have a patient that has a one-sided headache that kind of starts in the neck and radiates one side, that's pretty classic. On physical examination, you can have patients with like rest restricted neck motion and trigger points that can be indicative of that. Even, you know, diagnostic nerve blocks can help with making the diagnosis. Um, for example, like facet blocks where you inject the joints in the neck and if they get relief of their neck pain plus their headache, you know, that's pretty, um, uh, pretty helpful in making that diagnosis or even occipital neuralgia, which is a kind of a nerve issue in the spine that can cause uh, pretty classic headache type symptoms. Getting that blocked can also help. Um, and, and if the pain improves, help make that diagnosis. Okay. So I assume once you get a diagnosis, do, do physicians often refer to a neurosurgeon like yourself? 
It depends on really what the mechanism is. I mean, these patients don't often get referred to a surgeon per se because they may not have pathology that um, is, you know, needing of a surgeon at that moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, often with neck pain, we have this classic like treatment pathway in which we initiate patients in starting with conservative treatment, like, you know, primary care may refer them to physical therapy to try manual therapy, neck stabilization, postural uh, retraining, uh, trigger point release, massage therapists can sometimes assist in this. Chiropractic management can be um, of assistance in some cases too. And then, you know, these patients sometimes may be referred to sports medicine, orthopedics, or spine specialists, such as pain management providers uh, with other alternative treatments. So they may not all, all often go to a surgeon as that first uh, step in management as the next specialist. So it's important to recognize you know, recognize these as a well-known headache uh, phenomenon and how we can best treat these patients. Okay. Uh, what are some procedures if perhaps uh, a person doesn't respond to chiropractic care, physical therapy, et cetera, are there procedures that can be done? Yes. So we often start like with less interventional treatments and then kind of escalate unless there's red flag symptoms. You know, if there is someone with terrible neck problem that needs surgery, then that might be the next step. But in the classic, you know, stepwise progression, we try those very basic um, conservative treatment measures you mentioned, medications, physical therapy, chiropractic management, um, even massage therapy, dry needling, all those things. And then the next step would, in, in an interventional scale, would be more um, injections type treatments, such as occipital nerve blocks, which are uh, injections to kind of block C2, which is the upper cervical spine, um, cervical mediated, uh, cervical medial branch blocks. So that's like facet blocks where we'll inject the joints in the back of the neck. Um, Radio frequency ablation, if those are successful, the if the injections of facets are successful, often um, a series of two, uh, they're just medications that go into the joints so that typically will wear off. So an ablation can be more long-term relief of, of the joint pain and thus the cervicogenic headaches and um, um, Botox injections. So if it's felt to be more muscular, um, sometimes Botox uh, can be of benefit to patients. Okay. And then of course, you know, well, we could get into talking about the different surgeries um, if, uh, if, those, if those interventional treatments fail and surgery is all over the place, really depending on the patient's pathology, um, you know, and okay. what's affected. How effective are um, the surgeries and, and are, are there a lot of different surgeries or are there a few mainstays that people uh, get done if they have this type of head pain? Um, I think in terms of the types of surgeries, it's so uh, dependent on what the pathology is. Mm -hmm. um, so to say X surgery can treat cervicogenic migraines is false because it really depends on what the neck issue is that's causing the headache. So if it's a disc herniation, um, you know, there's discectomy, there's disc replacement, there's fusion surgery. If it's facet pain or pain and from arthritis in the joints, then, you know, we'll treat that with uh, fusion typically because that immobilizes the joints. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's even, you know, posterior options, anterior options. And then, um, for patients with occipital neuralgia, uh, sometimes even, you know, uh, occipital nerve, um, surgery can, can help with that too. So it, it really just kind of varies on what the problem is. Um, that's why it's important to make sure you go see a surgeon with, a, a experience in all those different types of procedures. So, cause one, once treatment doesn't necessarily fit all. Right. Uh, I did notice that you were using the word migraine when describing these, these types of headaches. Do you feel that the symptoms often mimic migraine or maybe even cause someone to, to have a migraine pathology? They, I, I, um, yeah, probably like interchange those words because uh -huh. I think often we, th as patients, um, we often think, you know, a cervicogenic, I call them cervicogenic migraines because we think of headaches as migraines sometimes when they're severe. But, um, but yeah, I think um, it's, they are different from your traditional migraine headache, but the symptoms are often very similar. Um, and so it's not a true migraine, 
but it is, you know, it's a, I guess we should call them probably cervicogenic headache. <laughs> <laughs> I, I caught on to that because I do think, um, and correct me if, if you disagree, but I do think some people are often either misdiagnosed for a long time uh, by the time they find uh, someone like you who notices that it is a cervicogenic issue or, um, or, or they themselves have been calling it migraine for so long that no one asks if, if they have neck pain. Um, so I found it interesting that you said that. So I think it's, 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 it's an issue uh, and everyone uses that word. Um, do you have a feel for how successful the surgeries are for helping people with their head pain? It, typically, you know, if it's a surgery that's treating the pathology um, that's causing the headaches, then surgery is usually very successful. You know, it, it uh, spine surgery results can really vary based on appropriate diagnosis. I mean, just like any other field, there can be misdiagnosis and, and uh, incorrect treatment. But mm -hmm. with with a pure purely cervicogenic headache that is caused from a root source in the neck and you fix that source is the the uh, success is, is um, usually over 90%. Okay, wow. Do you have a feel for, do you feel like there's more males or females um, that present with cervicogenic headache or anything like that? Um, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I would venture to say that it's probably more common in females. We just often don't have a strong of a neck um, as men. Mm -hmm. And um, that leads us to having more musculoskeletal issues at baseline. Not, not only is for neck problems, but just spine problems in general. And, um, and um, yeah, I think, you know, the importance of strength training in women and, and just our overall, you know, uh, strength in general is so important for prevention of, of these. And, you know, we touched a little bit on soft tissue um, diseases, hypermobility, and that those types of processes are tremendously more common in women. So, okay. And then is there anything else you'd like to add before you go? Did we miss anything or not touch on any issues that you think we should bring up? I just think it's important to know how common these are. And, and, and you hit the nail on the head by saying so many patients really think that they're suffering from migraines when potentially it could be something like a cervicogenic headache. And those are uh, treated completely differently. So I think it's important that if you have headache associated with neck pain, to know that it may be a type of headache like this and to really talk to your doctor about getting appropriate workup that may be an x-ray of your neck, you know, MRI of your neck and something to look for a potential source because uh, the treatments for this headache compared to just your typical migraine are markedly different. And if you're on a treatment for what you thought was migraines and it's not working, it's important to also bring that up to to look more in depth at your um, diagnosis and potentially see if uh, if it could be something else. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you everyone for being here for this episode of Headwise. Please join us again for our next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.